What's going on, everybody? It's Monday. Time for Swift News. As always, the links for everything you see in today's show will be on the GitHub repo. The link to that repo is in the description. And as usual, if you find articles throughout the week that you think would be great for the show, tweet it out with hashtag Swift News. I check that hashtag every week before I put the show together. All right, let's throw up the rundown and get into it. First up, we have an article from Matt Gallagher here, uh, App Architecture Basics in SwiftUI Part 2, SwiftUI's Natural Pattern. And this is a really long in-depth article with a lot of code samples. But essentially what Matt is trying to say here is many developers so far have kind of defaulted to MVVM for SwiftUI's architecture. And in this article, Matt tries to point out that it's more like MVC and it's not really MVVM. Uh, again, he has a very detailed argument with code samples explaining all this. Uh, but the reason I wanted to share this and I highly recommend reading it is this just illustrates how, you know, SwiftUI is so new and the community is still figuring out like, what is the best go-to architecture? You know, what is the best practices for all this stuff, right? So SwiftUI being so young, very, very fluid. And this article by Matt brings up a lot of great points on maybe MVVM, you know, isn't the default. So if you're interested in app architecture and want to hear Matt's point of view, check it out. Next up, we have an article from Danny DeVesa here, accessibility up to 11. Basically, it's just, you know, good traits of an accessible app uh, in iOS. And he goes through a bunch of different examples. A couple things I want to point out about uh, the article here is, first of all, uh, before we start, and this is kind of a side note, uh, if you will, uh, I think it's a good moment to mention that if you use UIKit components or just Swift UI, substitute that, just default Apple components, right? A lot of times thing will just, things will just work with no extra accessibility traits needing to be configured. So please rely on native UI components as much as you can. So again, the public service announcement here is, I know many of us you know, wanna be creative and wanna create custom components for everything to make our app unique. And that's fine, that's cool. Just understand that when you do all that, as with everything, there's trade-offs. You know, you're not gonna get accessibility for free. There's a lot of stuff Apple has built in if you use the native UI components. So again, just know the trade-offs and know that you're adding a lot of extra overhead and work if you decide to go that custom route. Maybe it's worth it, maybe it's not. But Danny here goes through things like button. And what I like about his article is he took the time to draw like custom illustrations to really illustrate what he's talking about. For example, this point here is that how, uh, you know, cells a lot of times are quote unquote buttons, meaning that when you tap a cell, it'll trigger an action, but it's not like quite a button. So you have to handle that accessibility trait a little bit differently. And again, he's got hand-drawn uh, diagram to like point that out. But he, you know, he goes through a bunch of different examples, the header, uh, you know, links, stuff like that. Really good detailed uh, article on how to improve the accessibility in your app. And again, I like the the uh, custom hand-drawn, you know, illustrations to really, you know, demonstrate the point. So if you want to brush up on your accessibility, here you go. Moving on, I have two articles about charts in Swift UI. Uh, the first one here from Sarah is about, you know, pie charts and donut charts. And, you know, you can click on it to like pop out a certain section, as you can see here. I believe there's an animated GIF down here uh, illustrating that. So pretty basic, uh, again, donut chart, pie chart. You can see the different sections like popping out as you tap them. Uh, and then the other chart I have is uh, recreating the Strava activity graph in Swift UI by Jean-Marc here. And this is the graph. Uh, well, I'll show you the movie here because you can see it's uh, in action of what we're doing here, right? So you're gonna like, you know, drag over the chart and you can see the information changing up top depending on like where the cursor is. So uh, Jean-Marc takes you through recreating that whole thing. And what I like about this article is that along the way, he provides screenshots showing you like what it should look like at this point. Um, maybe it's just me, I've said this before, I'm a very visual learner. So a lot of times these articles or tutorials will just be nothing but code, you know, for the whole article. Uh, but I like how Jean-Marc you know, as you go on shows you, you know, your progress, what it should look like so you can check it out. So anyway, I wanted to share these two articles on building graphs in SwiftUI. Next up, we have an article from UserLoaf, uh, SwiftUI Custom View Modifiers. And really it's, it's a tutorial showing you how to create custom view mod modifiers and why you'd want to do that. The reason I wanted to share this is to maybe start a discussion because it's a question I have with SwiftUI. So maybe leave a comment on like your opinion on this. But here's what the article says, right? You can create a custom modifier for when you have like text, right? And you can see the modifiers, font, padding, background color, corner radius, and it's the same for all this text, right? So you can create a custom modifier to kind of like combine all these modifiers into one. Cool, I get it. What I've been doing, and again, I'm not saying I'm right or wrong by any means, 
In this situation, what I've been doing is I've been creating my own custom text view. Like I would name this, I don't know, Sean's text view or something like that. And it would have all these in a custom view, kind of like refactoring it out. I don't, I mean, it seems to do the same thing. So maybe I'm splitting hairs here, but I'm kind of wondering, and of course it's situational, right? The classic, it depends, but I don't know. I'm kind of wondering what you all think if you've dealt with SwiftUI, like when do you go for the custom modifier or when do you just refactor out the view as a whole and build a, a reusable, you know, text view? Um, yeah, I, I, cause I always default to the reusable text view. I never use the custom modifiers. Uh, maybe I'm missing something. Help me out. Next up, I wanted to share a playground from Philip Nemechek here, uh, compositional diffable playground. And this has to do with uh, diffable data source and compositional uh, collection view layout uh, that was introduced in iOS 13. So we are back in UI kit land. But what Philip uh, created here was a nice playground that you can basically see examples of diffable data source and compositional layout in action. Of course, it's just, you know, dummy data kind of stuff. But if you're just learning this stuff and you want actual code that you can play with, you know, look and see it in action, uh, this is a great playground. Quick disclaimer though, that Philip points out is, please don't take these examples as the only correct way to work with these APIs. I am still figuring them out and experimenting. So again, the reason I wanted to share it was if you're new to this, uh, you can dive in, you can play around uh, as you can see with difficult data source, because it's different to like watch a, a video tutorial or watch an article on it. Uh, that's a lot different than actually being able to see the code and play with the code to like tweak it and adjust it um, to kind of like learn it that way. Moving on to the Twitter wisdom portion of the show, we have Noval here with a great piece of advice. If you're starting a new job during the pandemic, the best piece of advice I can give is to set up virtual, you know, quote unquote coffees with your team one-on-one -on -one time. And again, not a group call, like one-on-one -on -one time. I think that's the important part. One-on-one -on -one time is so valuable when you're working remotely. Uh, it's easier to slack someone if you've met them. Build these relationships early. And I want to stress on this build these relationships part. Uh, you've heard me talk about how like your network is so valuable as an iOS developer. And if you ask a lot of iOS developers, most of their network likely is former coworkers. I mean, that's how I've gotten various contracts. That's how I got my job at Aluna was a recommendation from a former coworker. So build that up. And it is difficult when you're remote, right? Because, you know, if you're working in the same office, random conversations pop up in the office, or maybe you can go to grab a quick bite to eat for lunch. Like it's a lot easier when you're in the office. So like Noval is saying, take the time to set up the one-on-one -on -one coffees. And then a piece of advice I would like to give on that is, Sure, you can talk about work, but I would try to talk about like non-work stuff because that's how you really build the relationship or the friendship is when you connect on, you know, some non-work topic or some non-work hobby. But yeah, the key point here is building these relationships that is insanely, insanely important. And then one little caveat, you know, of course, there's only so many characters the ball could use in the tweet. But yeah, it's great when you're starting a new job. But I also wouldn't neglect um, your existing relationships, even if you've been working with somebody for a year or two years, like... Don't let that relationship slip away just because you're remote. And now all you do is talk about work on Slack. Again, you're missing out on those, you know, random office conversations, those lunch, those, you know, quick coffees before work kind of thing. Those have kind of gone away. So again, great point by Noval. Try to set up these virtual coffees, build those relationships. Next, I want to share some design resources Apple put out. Now, I've shared this webpage a bunch, like their official design resources for like Photoshop, Sketch, uh, Adobe XD, etc. cetera. Uh, the big piece of news, well, just in case you've missed me share this before, you can get iOS 14, uh, you know, assets and stuff like that for your designs. Uh, but what just got added, which was kind of a big deal, is the macOS 11 Sketch library. And the reason this is a big deal is because obviously macOS 11 is Big Sur, quite a drastic difference in the visuals. Uh, so now you can have these uh, assets uh, like you see up here for macOS Big Sur, again, to build your designs. Sticking with the design theme, uh, well-known developer Steve Trouton Smith here uh, has put out his UI inspiration Pinterest board. Um, again, I'll have a link to it in the GitHub repo. But again, if you're looking for some UI inspiration, here's a whole bunch of them. I think it has the number up here, right? Yeah, 494 pins. So lots of UI inspiration that you can just scroll through if you're trying to get ideas for your app. Moving on to the LOLs of the week. Uh, I got two of them for you. One, this whole account is actually pretty funny, but this one in particular uh, made me laugh. So the account is shit user stories. Uh, if you're a software developer, you're probably familiar with user stories where you're, you're describing a feature, right? Like, you know, as a user, I want to be able to do this so that I can do that, right? That's a typical user story, as you can see in this format, but these, this is like making fun of it, right? So like, as a YouTube mobile user, I want to be offered a free trial of YouTube premium each time I open the app <laughs> so that I can have the convenience of opting in at any time in case 
case I ever changed my mind, right? Of course, this is all the, it's pointing out all the bad things that, you know, mobile apps do, the annoying things. There's a lot of funny ones in there. So I recommend checking out the whole account. That was just one I wanted to share that was pretty funny. And then finally, unfortunately, I can't play the audio. Many of you may, many uh, have seen this on Twitter. Her, her reactions are hilarious, but it's basically, you know, when a user is using your product, you think they're going to use it how they're supposed to, and then they keep not using it how they're supposed to. And then it's just hilarious, like her reactions, how they uh, devolve over time. Definitely go click this link in the repo and watch the video and hear the sound. Uh, it's hilarious. It's going to wrap it up for this week's episode. Catch you in the next one.